Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center. We're happy to welcome you to uh, the latest webinar in our series with OCTO. Um, today's webinar is on rapid vulnerability assessment for MPA managers, and we're very excited to welcome our two speakers who've been doing really great work in the climate adaptation world, and you'll be hearing from them in a moment. I'm going to introduce them here, but before I do that, I just want to remind you that uh, we have lots of opportunity for questions and discussion through this webinar interface, so I encourage you to write down your questions as you think of them, and we will make sure to get to those after the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Hutto and Laura Hansen. Uh, Sarah is the Ocean Climate Program Coordinator for Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary, where she integrates climate smart adaptation into sanctuary management and provides training for MPA managers around the country to undertake climate smart adaptation planning. Her background is in rocky intertidal ecology and she holds a Master's of Science in Marine Science from Moss Landing Lab. And Laura Hansen, uh, thinks climate change is everyone's problem and she wishes someone would do something about it. And uh, since she's one of those people, she has leapt into that void and co-created EcoAdapt with a team of similarly inclined people at, in 2008. She is the author of two books on climate change adaptation, Buying Time, a user's manual for building resistance and resilience to climate change and natural systems, and Climate Savvy, Adapting Conservation and Resource Management to a Changing World. Uh, she has been involved in a lot of different activities, including the creation of the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, CakeX.org, and the National Adaptation Forum. And she also served on the Nobel Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and is a Switzer Environmental Fellow and a US EPA Bronze Medalist. So welcome both Sarah and, and Laura, and I will let you take it away. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, this is Sarah. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, shout out if, if you have any issues hearing me. Um, it's great to be here with Laura. She and I have worked together for many years now and um, really had a wonderful opportunity through the Commission for Environmental Cooperation to put together this rapid vulnerability assessment tool that we'll be um, kind of telling you about today. And Laura's gonna run us through the tool itself after I provide just some introductory content um, and then I'll also um, describe uh, the latest use of the tool. Um, we used it at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary last fall um, and so we'll kind of report back on how that went. Um, so the Commission for Environmental Cooperation is um, a tr the tri-nation uh, organization under NAFTA that um, really seeks to collaborate on environmental issues across the three countries of US, Canada, and Mexico. And they um, asked us to put together this rapid vulnerability assessment tool, um, really as a way to help MPA managers engage in climate science in a meaningful way and to really inform how they're managing their MPAs um, based on what they already kind of have at their disposal and what they already know um, and the team that they're already working with. Um, this tool is available in English and Spanish and as you can see from this slide it's in three parts the user guide, um, a set of blank worksheets, and then a set of completed worksheets to provide an example of how the tool can be applied. Um, changing slides, here we go. Not changing, there um, we go. So, yep, okay. <laughs> it took, took a little while there. Um, so the, the goals of the project as, as set forth by the CEC were primarily to develop this common tool um, for the rapid assessment of marine and coastal habitat. Um, based on existing material that could be applied at various scales and then to pilot this tool um, with regionally grouped sites and they really wanted to see if we could use the tool um, across these very different sites in a meaningful way and to produce some comparable data that could actually help them and the MPA managers identify actions that could address vulnerabilities kind of across the entire Pacific Coast seascape. Um, so it was really um, 
kind of a, a two-part goal to these pilot workshops. We wanted to test the tool itself, but we also wanted to do it in a way that provided some meaningful information for um, the CEC and for the MPA managers that were participating in the workshops. Um, so to back up a bit and just provide a description of what these assessments are, um, what they do and what they don't do, and why you might want to undertake an assessment. Um, in general, vulnerability assessments are used to evaluate how climate change will affect your MPA, um, really in order to improve how you're managing your MPA to ensure long-term success and whatever that success might mean to you. Um, long-term sustainability or viability of your habitats or species um, is usually what people are, are really looking for. Um, a rapid assessment is a modified version of this process that is a little more simple. Um, you're not necessarily looking at every single climate stressor that might be impacting your resources. Um, instead, you're kind of looking at the most meaningful and significant ones. Um, it's a little more focused and tailored to your interests, um, but most importantly, it's more feasible to undertake based on what you already know and with the team that you already have. Um, though, as we learned through our pilot workshops, even just a little bit of um, kind of homework and legwork leading up to the workshop can make a big difference in how um, smooth the process goes. So why would you want to undertake a vulnerability assessment? Um, we went through a more exhaustive um, assessment at the site where I work at Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary back in 2013, 2014. And for us, it really helped us to prioritize what resources we wanted to focus on for the next part of our project, which was the adaptation planning part of the project. Um, and we ultimately developed a climate action plan for the sanctuary. Um, but our sanctuary is huge. We have very diverse habitats, many, many important and significant species. And so we knew that we could not feasibly undertake um, a full adaptation plan for all of those resources. And so for us, the vulnerability assessment helped us to identify which habitats we should really focus our planning efforts towards. Um, but not only does it help you to prioritize your resources and to figure out maybe where you should be focusing the next steps of your project, but um, to me the more interesting component that comes out of vulnerability assessments and really makes them useful is that it gives you an indication of why your resources are vulnerable so that when you're developing an action plan or you're um, tailoring your management plan to um, incorporate that climate information, you know what mechanism is driving that vulnerability and how to target your management actions to really address that particular mechanism. Um, these vulnerability assessments, rapid or otherwise, um, are not the end all be all. Um, we are still learning new, new things um, that sometimes can contradict what we learned from our vulnerability assessment or what we thought we had learned. Um, but also require further iterations of the process. And so we really see these assessments as um, kind of a launching point, um, especially if you've not necessarily um, in a strategic way incorporated climate considerations into how you manage your resources. This is a great place to start. It's also a great place to dig a little deeper into um, so a few of your resources that you're you know, more um, concerned or more interested in understanding how they might be interacting with climate change moving forward. But ultimately, this should be one of many you know, management tools in your toolbox that you can use to inform how you manage your MPA, um, can inform your management plan, et cetera. So what would you need to use this tool? Primarily an interest in learning how climate change is affecting the site that you're evaluating, um, but also some general knowledge of the site. Um, so this tool is, is designed to address habitats, although I'll talk later about how it could be modified to address species and other resources. Um, so you need a knowledge of those habitat types, obviously, some basic ecological knowledge, um, information on existing threats, and the management mechanisms that you have at your disposal. Also, um, a big piece is just the climate science. So an awareness of relevant climate impacts and access to basic climate information to support your understanding. 
Um, and we found in our pilot workshops those sites that had done a little bit of that work ahead of time, either by putting together um, a climate impacts report or um, a literature review of the regional um, trends in climate stressors for their area that really helped set them up for this vulnerability assessment and um, started them off kind of all on the same page. They understood what stressors they were dealing with and what that meant for their resources. So I think a little bit of um, prep work can go a long way. And then finally a day or two to spend applying all this information to the RVA tool. So for this project, um, once we had developed a draft of the tool, we wanted to, as I mentioned earlier, pilot it at a, a number of sites um, across all three countries, the Pacific coast of all three countries. And so we held these two um, regional workshops. One was up north um, on Vancouver Island to engage our Canadian colleagues and our US colleagues in the Pacific Northwest. And we had participation from Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary and National Park and Pacific Rim National Park and a number of their partners were in attendance. And we held another workshop in Southern California to engage with our Mexican colleagues and our um, US colleagues from Central and Southern California as well. Um, and we had participation from Guadalupe Biosphere Reserve, El Viscano Biosphere Reserve, and Channel Islands National Park, as well as the sanctuary um, for Channel Islands and Monterey Bay. We're all in attendance. Um, and so once we, we held these pilot workshops to run through the tool, um, to get feedback from everyone that utilized the tool, um, and then another product that came out of these pilot workshops, which is more on CEC's end, was kind of a summary report that helped the MPA managers identify potential collaborative actions um, based on similar vulnerabilities that we found across all the sites, um, even though they ranged from you know, way up north in Canada, all the way down south to um, islands off the coast of Mexico, um, we were able to find some common vulnerabilities and some collaborative actions that we hope will advance um, climate informed management for all of these MPAs. But now I'll turn it over to Laura to actually walk us through the tool itself. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, so now you've gotten a sense of why people might want to take these on. I'm going to share with you the steps of what the RCVA, or what the RVA tool actually has in it. Sometimes I refer to it as an RCVA so that it's clear that this one's about climate. Um, we've made it five simple steps and really the underpinning to know going into looking at these five simple steps is that the goal was to create a tool that really could be done in a single day by participants at a workshop based on the information that they already had in at hand because they'd done preparation in advance as well as just their years or decades of experience working at the sites. Um, so to quickly go through it, step one is really just defining the scope of the vulnerability assessment, which shockingly is harder sometimes said than it sounds like it should be. Um, the second is to construct the assessment matrix, which is a really nice step because it takes you about two minutes and is just copying things from one place to another. The third is to undertake the assessment. Fourth is doing the adaptation strategy development, which is once you have the assessment, you identify the problem, but you want to know what you do about it. Um, and then step five is creating your own narrative vulnerability assessment report so you have some sort of product to come out the other end in addition to the tables that you'll be creating. And the goal is, is that after you learn to use the RVA tool, you should be able to modify it to explore different facets of your MPA. Um, Sarah has already alluded to the idea that you can go beyond the habitat that this is set up for, but also you could expand this into a, a process with external stakeholders. You could expand it into a longer term process where you dig in more deeply. Next slide, please, and we'll go to step one. So step one, is aimed to be pretty simple. I realize that this is small font. Hopefully you guys can uh, expand your screen or better yet, if you wanna open the actual tool document and follow along, that would also be fine. Um, so you wanna define the scope of your vulnerability and there's a couple different questions uh, we want people to think through to get to that. So box one in the, um, in the RVA is to identify the habitat types that you want to do this assessment for. We recommended when we worked with the pilot sites that they didn't pick any more than three 
to get started with, but you could easily pick all the site types of habitats you wanted. Um, it would just take you longer than a day, clearly, unless you were working on it with a very small group who was fairly knowledgeable. In box two, you want to um, select the time scale that you're interested in assessing because the kinds of impacts that will happen based on the things you'll select in boxes three and four will vary across time scale. Um, a lot of the um, vulnerability assessments that were completed in the pilot process uh, looked at medium and long term, um, but you'll notice there's also near and very long term. And very long term might be a particularly significant consideration if you're thinking about um, MPA site designation, for example, um, as opposed to near term, which might be more relevant for some sort of restoration or construction project. In box three, um, we ask you to select the climate variables that are likely to affect your habitats, the habitat that, um, that's being considered. Um, and you can, like, there's three columns. As I said, you could select a three, up to three different habitat types. And for each of those habitat types, indicate which of these climate stresses are likely to happen. Things uh, ranging from increased water temperature, sea level rise, changing salinity, harmful algal blooms, Selecting again, ideally focusing on three choices here um, of the most likely to happen uh, variables. However, many things may be happening and if it's a very complicated system and you have a lot of potential impacts and you really do wanna consider them all because you think they will all have substantial impact, then go ahead and select many of them. Just recognize that that will move this from a rapid process to a slower process. And then finally in box four, we want you to reflect on what are the non-climate stressors that are currently affecting this habitat? What are the things you're already working on? And this should be a pretty easy list to go through because these are the challenges that as a site manager, you're already dealing with on a regular basis. Things like land source nutrient pollution, invasive species, um, over harvest, dredging, recreation, um, boat groundings, et cetera. So now that's step one. That should be pretty fast because the goal is that you're identifying things you already know. Next slide, please. In step two, you're going to take all of that information and you're just going to move it from those four boxes into the actual assessment table that you will be using in step three. This step is listed as a step because it might take some evaluation if in fact you've ended up selecting a lot more things than you can really fit in the table, or it may mean that you break the process up into several steps. Next slide, please. So this is the main vulnerability assessment matrix. It's a little truncated here. It's actually much longer, uh, but for the purposes of the slide, I've just given you two illustrative rows. Um, and so in column one, you will have listed the climate stresses and you will do a different one of these tables as you see up in the top row that's very small for each habitat type. So you write in the location where you are, the habitat type that you're considering and the time scale that you're thinking about. Those are mostly there to anchor you as a reminder as you're going through the process as well as these tables are useful for sharing information subsequently with partners who may not have been there the day you did the assessment or partners that you want to review specific aspects of it. For example, there may be um, uh, a stressor that the person who's the expert on it is not there and you want to send them the sheet so that they can consider it and share their opinion. Or as we did in the Greater Farallons, longer vulnerability assessment, if there were whole habitat types that we didn't have the right people at the table for, we could send them the tables and ask for their input. Um, so you'll indicate the climate stress in column one. In column two, based on that information that you've already come into the room knowing or tools that you've brought with you, you will identify in very basic terms the observed or projected direction and magnitude of the stress. So for example, sea level rise in most sites is increasing. Um, and you might even have a number of the, um, the, that quantifies how much it will increase by whatever year in the time scale that you have up in the upper right hand corner is relevant for. So this is very simple information, rough overview of what is happening. In column C, you're gonna list the anticipated effect on this habitat type. So what is the impact of sea level rise on if you've selected beach habitat, for example? It will be loss of beach or perhaps inland migration of beach. You could list all of those things. 
in column D, uh, you're going to indicate the likelihood. So how likely is it that that impact will happen at your site? Um, and I'm going to give you the rankings of how we do likelihood in a moment. Um, the next column is consequence, which I'm going to take you to table two to determine uh, how we assess consequence. And then after you've done those two things, you come back to table one and you identify risk, which is a combination of likelihood and consequence. Then we'll go to table three, we'll assess adaptive capacity, and you'll put all those pieces together to identify vulnerability. So let's go on to those um, next factors. Sarah, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so we're using these basic models of um, vulnerability, except we've changed some of the words. So many of you may be familiar with the idea of exposure plus sensitivity minus adaptive capacity equals vulnerability. That is the standard method. Unfortunately, exposure and sensitivity are two very confounding words we've discovered for people. Um, and there's been a movement in some of the more lay vulnerability assessments to use terms like likelihood and consequence um, in place of exposure and sensitivity. And in the case of likelihood, the rankings are pretty coarse. Uh, we have an almost certain, which is a greater than 50% probability. We have a likely, which is 50-50 chances. Possible, less than 50%. Unlikely, probably low, but not zero. Um, and rare, which is has a probability that's very low and maybe even close to zero. It's unlikely that if something had a zero likelihood, you would have even listed it in the initial list of climate stressors, so there isn't a zero risk. Um, so those are the, the rankings that will go into that column D of likelihood um, on table one. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next table is where we try and, is where we work to calculate the consequence. Um, and we take, going back to those earlier boxes on the first page, we've listed the non-climate stressors. And part of identifying the consequences that we want you to start thinking about the interactions of climate change with non-climate change stresses together. So how are those interacting at your site and what will be the meaning of that interaction? Because that's where uh, a large portion of the impact of climate takes place. And unfortunately, in a lot of vulnerability assessments, it's thought of very separately. We just think about climate in the absence of everything else that's going on, um, which is unrealistic and actually will cause you to miss a lot of opportunities as Sarah was saying earlier, for what are the mechanisms of vulnerability and how could you reduce that vulnerability. So column A will be easily filled out because you will be taking what you have listed previously um, on in step one. Um, and again, you'll put the location, the habitat type, and the time scale at the top so that that's a, a point of re reference for anyone using these. In column B, you'll just uh, uh, lay out how the stressor is currently affecting this habitat type. In the absence of climate change, how is that impact already ha playing out? What is it that uh, invasive species are doing to the habitat that you're interested in? What are, um, is uh, land source nutrient pollution doing to the site that you're interested in? Um, and then you make a quick assessment about how climate change might make this better or worse. Do you think that there's a possibility that climate change could improve this condition? Or do you think that it's more likely that climate change will um, exacerbate the condition? And then over in column D, uh, at the top of each one of those sub-columns, you will list your three climate stresses again. And you will now uh, combine the non-climate stress and the climate stress together. And if, in fact, there's an implication of multiple climate stresses with that non-climate stress, one should feel free to sort of work across boxes to make that identification. So in the case of uh, an invasive species, it may be that increasing water temperatures will further favor that invasive species. And that's the kind of information that would go into that box. At the bottom of each of these columns, you will then evaluate for each of the climate stresses in combination with all of those non-climate stresses, what will be the consequence of it? And the consequence will range from catastrophic, in that the habitat will cease to exist or have its function permanently altered. Um, and that might be the case of, uh, for example, coral reefs with increasing temperature and acidification. That could be a catastrophic combination, especially when you add in uh, nutrient pollution. 
major in that key species or functions may be dramatically altered, moderate in that species numbers may decline, function may be diminished such that habitat is seen as degraded but is still present. Minor, the habitat will continue to function, but activities such as recovery will be impaired and negligible. The habitat and its key components will not be visibly or functionally affected. So you give those uh, qualitative rankings um, across these um, impacts. There are versions of vulnerability assessments that would have you do this numerically, and at the end you would come up with a total number. And we'll be doing a little bit of that in a subsequent step. Can I have the next slide, please, Sarah? So now you're going back to that table one. You're filling in the consequence um, in column E. Uh, and now you have a likelihood and a consequence. And you'll go down to this table and you'll combine those two things. So that if you have a moderate consequence and a possible likelihood, it would give you a moderate vulnerability. If you had a likely likelihood uh, and a major consequence, you would have a high vulnerability and so forth. You then list in uh, column F what that, what that risk is. Um, so you've now, by combining likelihood and consequence, established your risk, which will be combined with your adaptive capacity, which is the next column, which will be going on to table three to calculate to get to your final vulner vulnerability. So as you can see, these are pretty quick assessments to make, uh, but you are cataloging what, were, what was the logic behind how you got to that decision in these tables so that it's a point of conversation and education across a team. Next slide, please, Sarah. Okay, table three, adaptive capacity. Perhaps one of the most vexing pieces of any vulnerability assessment. Um, we, after discussion with the sites, uh, the decision was to break this up into two component parts that could be weighted more evenly. One was the ecological adaptive capacity, which we have listed as ecological potential at the top of this table, this slide, um, and section B, which was the social potential. So ecological potential are what are the things that are inherent in your site, in your habitat, that will affect the ability of it to respond or not respond to climate change. Whereas social potential were what are the factors in your MPA site as far as governance and staff and funding um, that will could affect your ability, um, or, or politics rather, um, that could affect your ability to um, reduce vulnerability. So up at the top, under ecological potential, you can see that that's things like biodiversity, um, past evidence of recovery, the value or importance of the site, um, physical diversity, uh, how much uh, variability is there in terms of the physical site in order for things to persist, um, uh, the extent, distribution, and connectivity. So for each one of those, you uh, they get ranked on a scale from one to five, one being critical, um, meaning it's in very poor conditions, <laughs> um, and five being superior, meaning that you have the ideal condition at your site for this factor. Um, under social potential, we broke it up again into organizational capacity, which is the, the, the training and the time that your staff has. Um, stakeholder relationships, do they support the site or is there animosity about the site? Um, the stability and longevity of the site, uh, as well as responsiveness in your ability to, to, to get the resources that are needed. Then there's a management potential, which includes things like there's an existing mandate that could include you doing something about climate. Um, there's monitoring and evaluation capacity, so you can identify whether or not the thing, whether or not there's a problem on site, or if you implement something, is it effective? Uh, the ability to learn and change um, a proactive management approach as opposed to a very prescriptive and responsive management approach. Um, again, those partner relationships, but here in terms of how management is undertaken and science and technical support. And in all of these cases, you'll see that there's an option for other. And that was true up at the beginning in boxes one through four as well. So that if what you identify as important isn't there, there's room for you to put it in. So for all of these, you would at the top have a total number and you would calculate the average in the bottom row. And in the bottom, you would do the same. And then in order to make the weighting uh, the way that the site managers thought was most important, we then 
average those two averages so that ecological potential has an equal weighting to the social potential. And at the end, you come up with a total rating that gives you an adaptive capacity value that in the very bottom you can see is low, moderate, or high based on what that total average is. Then you take that number, next slide, Sarah, you bring it back up to magical table one where you're synopsizing everything, um, and you uh, indicate what that adaptive capacity is um, in the second to last column. And then in the final column, you'll combine risk, which you calculated as between low and extreme, and adaptive capacity, which was from low to high. And with that, you will get your final vulnerability of low, moderate, or high for each of these factors in relation to your site. With that, you can then go on um, to the next slide. I'm actually going to skip this because we're we're, we need to move this along, um, to how you calculate your adaptive strategy development. So you'll write down in column one the vulnerability from the other side. So what was that point of high vulnerability? And in it, you'll sort of, you could list some notes as to what factor was it that caused the high vulnerability. Was it a low adaptive capacity? Was it a high um, sensitivity? Or was it, sorry, was it a high consequence? Or was it a high likelihood? And from that, you can start designing strategies. So what are ways that you could decrease the combined effects of uh, increased eutrophication along with increasing temperature? So there are strategies that could focus on how do you continue to reduce land source pollution, uh, hence the big announcement that was made in Australia recently for further reducing nutrient input um, to the coral reef system. Or you could also do some of the kinds of things they've done in Australia with They've tried to use shading to keep it cooler at a site. Um, some of those might seem rather crazy, which is why we have columns C and D, so that you could actually evaluate um, the, the cost and the likelihood of success. I'm just noticing that column D is actually mislabeled. So column C uh, is cost, and you would indicate uh, what, what the, whether it was high, medium, or low. And you might want to have notes as to whether it's a high cost for your site or a high cost in general. Um, the Great Barrier Reef will not be paying the cost of the diminished nutrients, uh, but that will be a cost for the region. Um, and then in the feasibility or the likelihood of success, you again measure high, medium, or low. Will shade cloths over the coral reef be a good long-term feasible and effective solution? Probably not, um, but it might be uh, a worthwhile thing in the short term. After you've identified a number of strategies that you think are useful, you could even go through a prioritization exercise. You could go through an exercise of identifying who would be good partners for doing those and how you would actually implement them. But that might be a bit more than you could accomplish in a single day. But I would certainly not dissuade you from it. The final step, next slide please, is to synopsize this whole process into some sort of tool to communicate. One could take the tables that were created in this and um, uh, make them in a format that was useful for communication, if that works in your region. Uh, we've worked with some folks who've created um, cartoon versions of what their scenario, what their vulnerability was and their solutions were. Um, and then there's also this narrative um, version that we put in the packet, which is just essentially like a Mad Lib, if you've ever played that game, uh, where you can rewrite what your findings were into a narrative format, if in fact that would be useful for presenting to a group like an advisory committee or a regional communication, or just as a reminder for your team. All of that can in fact be done in a day. It seems like a lot, um, but it's a pretty rapid process because it's largely relying on information that you already have at hand because you prepared in advance or you just inherently know because you work on the site. And it's collating it into a format that forces you to explicitly consider climate change. And Sarah is now gonna take you through an example of how this process went when it was applied at Gray's Reef. Yes, thank you, Laura. That was a really great run through of the tool. And I hope um, people have been able to see that, um, you know, it provides a framework, but it's highly adaptable. Um, and so at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, we had um, interest from the staff there to undergo a vulnerability assessment. Um, 
Gray's Reef is um, an offshore underwater um, live bottom reef um, off the coast of Georgia. And it's quite small, at least relative to the sanctuary where I work, which is um, most of California. Um, and so they were, instead of doing a uh, an assessment of, of multiple habitats, which would have been more relevant for a site like mine, they really wanted to do an assessment of um, multiple species that they have at their reef. And so asked if that would be possible for us to kind of alter the tool um, to make it applicable to assessing species, um, which was not very difficult to do at all. Here's just a photo kind of showing you what you can see down at Gray's Reef. Um, and so the sanctuary has a number of restrictions. Uh, part of it is, is closed completely to fishing or diving. Um, I think they call it their research area, but um, I think that's about a third of the reef, and then about two thirds of it are, are open, um, but there's restrictions on things like anchoring and collecting and some types of fishing. Um, just to give you a sense and, and some beautiful photos there of what you can see at Gray's Reef. Um, this is the team we put together. We held a two day workshop um, and we brought people in that had expertise on the species that the um, sanctuary staff were interested in assessing. So ahead of the workshop, they, they did a bit of work to figure out, um, you know, these are the target species we, species we would like to assess. And so they then identified, based on those species, um, the experts that they would need in the room in order to answer these types of questions about, uh, about these species. Um, and so these folks ended up working together in um, three different teams. So uh, just to give you a sense of how we structured the workshop, the first half of the first day was spent as a large group. Um, we, you know, we could have done this in one day, but we wanted to spend some time discussing the climate stressors that are projected um, to occur at Gray's Reef. And so we put together a presentation kind of going through those climate impacts and potential stressors just so that everybody's kind of working from the same um, set of data and information. Um, and we did a little tutorial going through the tool, which you could always do ahead of time. Um, and then for the rest of the workshop, folks worked in these three different groups. And so they, they basically split up the nine species among the three groups based on the expertise. I think we had an invertebrate group and two different fish groups um, based on the, the types of fish they were assessing. Um, and so really, I mean, adapting the tool to, to be used for species was pretty straightforward. And really the, the only changes were in the, the only like real content changes were in the adaptive capacity section um, because some of those factors you're looking at um, like biodiversity within the habitat um, we wanted to change to different factors like um, genetic diversity within the species or morphological plasticity um, so different factors that would um, result in either a higher or lower adaptive capacity for species rather than habitats and so this was really the first application of the final tool following those pilot workshops and the revisions that we made. And so we wanted to do an evaluation and, and get from them um, their takeaway on how the tool functioned for their purposes. And we got some really great feedback, not only on how the workshop went, but ways that the tool could be modified um, for, for more appropriate analysis for some of the participants, which is totally fine. And that's really the one big point of this tool is that it just provides a framework and is definitely open to be altered and changed. Um, you know, the only important thing is that when you're assessing a number of resources, you assess them all the same way. Um, but this tool is really for use by the particular MPA that's, that's using it. Um, and so if, if, for example, you're not concerned with social potential, you really only are interested in ecological potential and you want to consider social potential after the fact, which is one, one piece of feedback we got, then that's totally fine. You just, you know, ax that part of the assessment as long as it's consistent across all of your resources, it's going to serve the same purpose for you. So I just wanted to show some of the feedback that we got for Gray's Reef. Um, the green box was kind of the takeaway. They found that increased storms and increased temperature were two of the most critical drivers of change for Gray's Reef, which was 
um, a useful result in and of itself. And they identified some opportunities for further collaboration, and they provided us with some recommended changes to the worksheets and process for future applications, specifically at National Marine Sanctuary sites. Um, and so the alterations that we would maybe make for application to the sanctuary may be different for um, you know, a national park or a state MPA that's maybe smaller and has different types of um, restrictions or management activities. Um, and we, so in our evaluation, we found, you know, for the most part, everyone found the workshop was a good use of their time. They found the RVA tool was effective and that, that the introductory material was effective. Um, so, you know, that's it. We really would look forward to hearing from folks um, as the tool is, is continuing to be used for the sanctuary program. We're really hoping we can apply the tool at some additional sites. Um, beyond Gray's Reef, but we're still kind of looking into that um, and really looking forward to hearing from people about how they might have adapted the tool for their use uh, moving forward and hoping that it serves as a launching point for folks to just start having conversations at their MPAs and um, at their protected areas regarding um, resource vulnerability to climate change and how to kind of incorporate that into their management. Um, Laura, do you want to give any final thoughts before we maybe take some questions? Uh, uh, the only final thought uh, is just to reiterate what you just said, Sarah, of uh, this tool is really meant to be adapted to whatever the questions and needs you have are. Um, it's really a starting point and a framework for how to think about explicitly asking about the impacts of climate change on the work you're doing so that you don't miss opportunities to improve your long-term likelihood of success uh, in your MPA's mission. Okay, well, this is Lauren. Thank you so much, Sarah and Laura. That was a great explanation of the tool and how it's being used. And so I'm gonna turn to our questions and I encourage, I see if a couple have come in already, so I just encourage you to go ahead and type in your questions and we'll do our best to get to them. So the first uh, from Kristen Dawn is asked, I'm curious why Rocky subtitle was not a habitat type to choose from during step one. Uh, this is a major subtitle habitat type in Oregon and Washington uh, and just wondered why it was not included. I don't think there was any reason why it wasn't included. And like I said, that's why that other box is there um, to really allow one to put in whatever the specific type of habitat that one is interested in is. Um, I think that there was, from folks who are using it, I think there was, um, I don't know why, I, I can't answer why it wasn't there. I, I mean, think, I think yeah, that there was- I think we were, we were thinking that kelp forest would be rocky subtitle potentially. Um, but yeah, and it, as Laura said, there's an other box for a reason. And this is really just kind of some categories to work from and to get you thinking about the habitat types you might want to assess. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think Kristen is from Oregon. And so she was just commenting that kelp forests are not as prevalent in Oregon and Washington as they are in California. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question from Brian Grieve is, when choosing habitats, how did you decide what scale to examine? Um, and also, he asks about Gray's Reef. Why was the decision made uh, to look at um, species as opposed to habitat? Uh, I'll, I can answer the first one. Uh, and then, Sarah, if you want to give the details on Gray's Reef. So the first one is whatever scale you, your management activity happens at. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing the assessment at, we very explicitly write in the time scale. We probably should have given, I should probably should have given you a little bit of preamble about um, selecting the spatial scale. So you want to match the RVA, the RVA with the, um, the scale at which your management activities are undertaken. Because if you were to do it for, <clears throat> for example, kelp forests writ large across the entire coast of California, you'd have a very different sense of vulnerability than you would for kelp forests at a given site. So definitely look at it for your management scale. Yeah, and then as far as um, why Gray's Reef decided to focus on species, I believe, and, and 
it would be best to kind of ask the, the managers at Gray's Reef themselves. But my sense was that because they have a pretty um, small sanctuary with that one major habitat type, that they didn't see a great utility in doing a habitat level assessment. Um, whereas at Farallons, we have, you know, a number of very varied habitats and we wanted to do a habitat level assessment so that we could better understand which habitats might be more vulnerable than others. Um, and because they have kind of the, the one habitat type, that live bottom reef, they instead wanted to focus at the species level. And I know we did consider kind of starting the workshop off with a habitat assessment, um, which I would actually recommend because I think it's a useful exercise even if you're just looking at one habitat type to go through the assessment for that habitat type and then break off and do species level assessments, I think is um, a very useful exercise. Okay. Um, there's a question, where can I get the tool and is it in a PDF or online? And, and I know that it is. And Sarah, I don't know if you have the, the link that you can project here. Right, yeah, I was hoping it was on the first slide. Is it at the end, Laura, do you know or? Maybe I could. Um... I am just realizing that we did not have it. I just inserted it by text into that answer. I don't know if you can um, oh, access okay. it. Yes, yeah, so I, I can just say that if you Google CEC, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, that's Commission for Environmental Cooperation, Rapid Vulnerability Assessment, you will find it. It will come right up. Uh, so, and, and we can uh, maybe project it in a minute as we go through these questions. Maybe, Sarah, you could just Someone go ahead. Someone posted it in the chat. So. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, another question from Joseph Bauer is, how does this tool compare to similar tools like the Mississippi-Alabama Sea Grant Coastal Resilience Index? I don't know if you all are familiar with that tool or not. I have not ever used that tool. I've seen it, but I've never used it, which does not give me a deep knowledge of how well it works, or not not how well it works, but how it works as compared to how this one works. But you could probably look at it to the landscape of tools out there, right, Laura? Because you have a pretty good yeah, thing. yeah. So the there are a lot of tools out there. Most of them are designed to be a more in-depth process. Um, the goal of this was explicitly to come up with something that could be done based on having whatever information you have at hand and running it as a conversation for the day. They all have extremely similar steps, um, just translated into different words. Um, and, and they're all based on sort of the same underlying theory. Again, that, uh, that flow chart that I showed at the beginning of sensitivity plus exposure um, minus adaptive capacity equals vulnerability. Um, and based on the fact that they're all uh, similar in that, it's really just finding the one that is you're comfortable with um, and answers your question specifically. This one was designed specifically for MPAs originally thinking about habitat, but modifiable to anything. And like I said before, really about how can you do it very quickly with the information you have, rather than making it a long protracted process. Sarah, for Greater Fairlands, that took two years? Yeah, it Is did. From, <laughs> yeah, from start to finish, um, we assessed uh, over 30, over 30 resources, no, 40, 44 resources total. Whereas when we applied this rapid tool at Gray's Reef, we did nine species. Um, so nine compared to 44. And then we had a very extensive literature review and, and very long report to follow. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you, when you decide to undertake a vulnerability assessment, I think kind of the first question you ask yourself is, you know, how exhaustive of a process do we want this to be? Um, what, what is the ultimate goal? What type of information do we want? And your answers to those questions will really help determine which of the many tools that are out there would be most appropriate for you to use. So speaking of adapting the tool, uh, there's a question, are there any restrictions or limitations to using this for MPAs outside North America? And I would just add to that, can you, you know, do you have any advice about how one might use this to use in a different geography? 
there's absolutely no restriction. Uh, the only thing that would be different is if we missed a habitat type. Um, we tried to include everything we could think of, and as someone just brought up, we we used a different term for um, rocky subtitle. Um, if there's a missing habitat type, put that in. Um, my anticipation is that in um, well, actually, I don't even think that's going to be true. I don't, I think there's very little that you would have to change. Okay, uh, a couple more questions here, and I encourage people, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and send them in. Uh, so Michaela Hemmings asked, is there a publication of the Gray's Reef case study? And I can actually answer that. It's, it's in uh, preparation now, so it should be published by midsummer. So encourage you to check back. We are actually in the process of updating the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries climate page to make sure that it includes some of these uh, materials and, and puts them in one place so they're easier to find. And the other question is from Alexa Rosenberger who, who mentioned that she came in a little bit late and she wanted to know how this assessment is different from the management effectiveness tracking tool by the World Bank or the how is your MPA doing? And uh, I, I can just, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. All I was going to say is I am familiar with both of those tools, and I would say that they are general assessment tools about uh, MPA uh, effectiveness rather than targeted at climate. But I invite Laura and Sarah to add to that. Yeah, so I've actually, I actually am familiar with those too, I'm very excited to say. Um, and absolutely, they are a, gen they are a general tool. Uh, the World Bank one has a little, has a, I believe, a question or two that are specific around climate. But this process could actually help you better inform your answers in either of those tracking tools by providing some specific climate assessment. Um, and to the last piece is, could any of this information be put into those databases? Yes, it could. And if more people were doing this, it would actually be a nice addition to those databases to be able to add more specific um, climate content beyond some um, beyond uh, coral bleaching, I believe, is in, is, is the, maybe one of the only climate factors explicitly listed in those databases. Thanks. And Gonzalo Cid is asking, is the use of this tool recommended along with the review of the management plan or other planning review processes? Sarah, do you want to answer that? Because that was one of the, sure. one of the aspects we tried to work on this for. Yes, um, yes, definitely. I, I think when a site is going through management plan review, that's an opportune time to undergo um, an assessment like this one. I would um, recommend it be kind of less rapid for that purpose um, to assess, you know, maybe more of the resources that are addressed in your particular management plan. Um, I could speak to sanctuary specifically you know, when we go through management plan review, we're looking at, you know, the current condition of our resources through our condition reports, um, typically. And so we internally are working through a process right now to figure out how best to incorporate something like a vulnerability assessment, something like this, um, to maybe feed into the condition report process or vice versa for both of those to ultimately inform um, a management plan review and to to really streamline this, these climate considerations into how you're managing your MPA. Laura, do you wanna add anything? No, I think that that was beautiful. Oh, I, the one thing that I would add is that early on, we also tried to use the indicator assessments that are part of some of those processes already mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a pathway into the tool. Okay, and uh, here's a, Another question, I'm curious how uncertainty in knowledge and data might affect the outcome. If you had an example of how a group worked through a knowledge gap, for example, a species where the risk or climate impact is less clear, this might be especially true if you're interested in a longer term time frame. Um, I can give my first go at that, Sarah, and then if you have a specific example from Gray's Reef, that would be great. So one of the, um, one of the things that we tried to discourage people from doing in their solution sets was writing need more research. Um, however, this is a case where that is a totally acceptable answer. 
um, having um, the, the first thing is you want to you want to make an assessment based on what you know because one of the unfortunate things about climate uh, knowledge is that it is an inherently uncertain and incomplete data set we will not know what the full effect is until it has happened at which point it's too late to plan for it so how you develop a a balance in that so that you actually can be making management decisions is imperative. Um, so we encourage people to make that educated decision to complete the tool. However, we also ask people to flag areas of deep uncertainty. And those flagged areas of deep uncertainty you can bring to the end when you're developing adaptation strategies. And you can use them as places where you either need to establish more solid monitoring for monitoring and evaluation to determine impact and if you are in fact going to apply an intervention to make sure that it is having the desired effect i actually would encourage you to do that for all of your interventions but i realize that it's a, a, a it's a resource challenge um, and the other thing is if there are areas where people just simply don't know and that's going to be the case in a lot of things having to do with acidification for example we simply don't have the historic research because there was so there has been such a long held belief in the buffering capacity of oceans and ph not being a highly fluctuating factor that the number of taxa for which we know what the impacts of, of acidification will be for is low where there are places where you need to write in need to prioritize research with a partner and in the case of the work in greater Farallons, acidification was actually one of the areas where research priorities were developed and it was determined that that wasn't um, shirking responsibility and making a decision but rather it was such a, a, a black box that it, we needed more information yeah, and I've seen people deal with uncertainty in a few different ways in this type of process. One of them is by um, providing kind of a ranking for uncertainty, which you could certainly incorporate into this tool um, for any of the factors or the um, rankings that you provide, you know, high, medium, low, you could include a degree of uncertainty, you know, one through three or one through five, and it could provide, you know, a reader of the report or a user of the information, kind of an indication of how comfortable the participants were with the information that they provided in the tool um, to provide that context. Another was um, I've seen folks when they came across a climate stressor that they felt um, is likely going to play a significant role, but they know so little about what that role might be that they decided to just not include it in the assessment and to kind of address that on the back end through the narrative um, in describing that you know, this is what we assessed, uh, but with the caveat that this is a stressor that we, you know, feel will likely be important or significant to this resource, but we just didn't feel like we had enough information to actually um, go through the assessment process with the stressor. Um, what was the other one? I had another thing, another way that I've seen people deal with uncertainty. Oh, so kind of incorporating like scenario planning. Um, into an assessment process, which can really be done at multiple stages of this type of process. But if you have a stressor where you know, for example, you might know the trends, like the direction of the stressor, but the magnitude is uncertain, you could kind of do the assessment um, twice. One for like the low end of the, mag like a low magnitude end of that stressor and one for the high magnitude end of that stressor. So it's kind of like doing some scenario planning um, and that's kind of more relevant when you're looking at the adaptation strategies that could come out of identifying these vulnerabilities. Um, but that is another way of dealing with uncertainty that I think makes people feel much more comfortable because they are now looking at, you know, multiple options for that stressor. And if the stressor ends up being, you know, a lower magnitude, this would be a more appropriate response. If it's of a greater magnitude, then this would be a more appropriate response. All right, well, I just want to thank both of you, Laura and Sarah, thank you so much for the great presentation. And this will be posted online at Open Channel. So if anyone uh, missed a little bit of it or want to share it with colleagues, please go ahead and check the Open Channel's Octo site and you will find it there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.